animal health is more challenging because our patients are a lot different. They use our hospital as their toilet, as their scratching post, and as their chew toy. And I would go one step further and say that safeguarding shelter animal health is even yet more challenging because they use their hospital as their home. So for these and many other reasons, proper shelter sanitation requires an open mind and attention to detail and the ability to think outside the box. So the three basic levels of sanitation that I'm going to talk to you about today are cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. Each of these are fundamentally different, even though the terms are often used interchangeably. So it's important that we understand the definitions if we're going to be able to effectively, um, effectively use our cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization products. <coughs> So we can think of sanitation like a staircase with higher stairs corresponding to higher numbers of microorganisms. And by microorganisms, I mean bacteria, fungi, and viruses. So you can see that while cleaning removes the bulk of organic material, it still leaves a relatively large amount of microorganisms in place. Disinfection significantly reduces the number of microorganisms to a level that is ideally safe for human and animal health. Whereas sterilization, by definition, is the absence of any viable microorganism. So the ground zero, if you will. So another point I'd like to drive home before we tackle each of our levels individually is that sanitation is sequential. So even though all of our levels are fundamentally different, they're all interrelated. I need to clean something before I disinfect it. I need to disinfect it before I sterilize it. So, for example, if I take an unclean item, such as a stool sample, get it? <laughs> and I spray it with disinfectant, all I get is wet poop, not disinfected poop. And that's because the disinfectant can't penetrate through the organic material that should have been removed by the cleaning process. So the first level that we'll talk about in more depth is cleaning. So cleaning is the process that removes foreign material, such as microorganisms, uh, soil and organic materials from an object. So examples of cleaning would be sweeping the floor with a broom or cleaning up vomit with a moist paper towel. The, for the foreign organic material that we're talking about in shelters is primarily composed of animal matter and excretia, be it blood, sweat, or tears, hair, urine, or vomit. But the numero uno material that I'm talking about when it comes to shelter cleanliness and the one that nobody wants to clean up is? Poop, yes, excellent. You gotta pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, even if it's that ancient little turdlet in the corner that you know everybody else has walked by a million times. You gotta pick it up. The fecal fairy isn't real. We gotta pick it up. But picking up poop need not be toil and drudgery. It can be fun and fashionable too. So as proof, I offer up a swatch of celebrities seen here picking up after their respective rovers. On the right, we have Minnie Driver, who is dipping down to detain some dung. In the center, we have Hugh Jackman, who is manning up to manage some manure. And finally, on the left, we have Catherine Zeta-Jones, extricated from exercise to exact some excrement. If celebrities can pick it up, so can we. So next is sterilization. So sterilization is the process that destroys all living microorganisms. And it's a term that's thrown around lightly and is often misused. In a shelter setting, typically the only thing that we're going to be sterilizing is going to be the surgical instruments that are processed typically in a countertop autoclave um, that works through heated and pressurized water vapor. We don't sterilize the floors, we don't sterilize the dog food bowls, no matter how much bleach we dump on them, and we don't even sterilize the patient's skin prior to surgery. All of those are examples of disinfection. So the, me the mechanisms and protocols evolved, uh, involved in achieving sterility are beyond the scope of my lecture, but it's important to understand that as shelter staff and employees, unless we're operating an autoclave, we're not sterilizing anything. But why not? Why not sterilize everything we can to make our shelters as sanitary as possible? Well, like I said, autoclaves um, primarily work through heated and pressurized water vapor, which just isn't practical in a large-scale setting like a shelter. The other two primary mechanisms for achieving sterility are going to be radiation and chemical sterilants, which are incredibly dangerous not only to animal health, but also 
human health, and the environment. Um, so for that reason, disinfection is going to be the meat of our discussion today, and it's also the reason why disinfection is always going to be a balance between efficacy and toxicity. So disinfection is a process that reduces the number of pathogenic microorganisms to a level which is not harmful um, to animal or human health. It's the meat of our discussion today because disinfection can make or break a shelter. Disinfections are integral to shelter sanitation and operation, but how much do we really know about the disinfectants that we're using? In order to really understand the disinfectants that we're using, we need to go beyond the label. How many of you have actually read the label of the disinfectant bottle that your shelter uses? Okay, so not very many of you, right? And why not? Because it's boring chemical jargon that doesn't mean much to most people. So rather than read labels, MSDS reports, and spec sheets, a lot of shelters rely on their friendly uh, company representative to tell them about the products that will work for them in language that they can understand. Sounds legit, right? Well, not entirely. A lot of representatives make false claims about the abilities of their products, and these false claims can appear um, on websites, on pamphlets, and even on the product label itself. So for example, some disinfectants claiming to be parvicidal have actually been proven in multiple studies not to be effective against killing parvovirus. For any claim a company makes about its product, we need to seek out um, independent research. We don't want to rely on the word of the person who's paid to tell us what we want to hear. So what does that mean? Does that mean that every already overworked shelter manager needs to spend their time off combing through journal articles to try and figure out what is the truth about the disinfectants that they're using or thinking about buying? No, not necessarily. Call your local veterinarian, call a nearby vet college, because chances are they've already paid somebody to do the legwork for you to give you the unbiased information that you need. So when it comes to comparing disinfectant products, um, ASPCA Pro has a fantastic table available on their website, and I'll have the link up at the end of my presentation. I recommend that every shelter print this out, laminate it, and hang it up somewhere where their disinfectants are stored, because this table is awesome. So when we compare disinfectants, the things we want to know are, so what does the disinfectant kill? Is it inactivated by organic material? How stable is it when prepared, or how often does it need to be reconstituted? What's our minimum contact time? And do we have to rinse afterwards? So if we go through these one by one, these are going to be the three disinfectants that are most common in shelter settings today. So the first one, sodium hypochlorite, it's household bleach. Is it effective against parvovirus? Yes, at a dilution of 1 to 32. Panleukopenia? Yes, at 1 to 32. Khaleesi? Yes, at 1 to 32. Ringworm, yes, but at 1 to 10. So I made up a little rhyme to help remember this. At 1 to 32, Khaleesi, Parvo, and Panlu. Mix at 1 to 10 means ringworm there again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, is it inactivated by organic material? Yes. So this is important because it means that if you're using household bleach to clean your shelter, you really have to be thorough in your cleaning process. You've got to have all that organic material removed before you apply your disinfectant. Stability when prepared, so 24 hours if protected from light. So it needs to be kept in a covered bucket. It needs to be kept in an opaque square top or spray bottle. Minimum contact time is 10 minutes. And is a rinse required? Yes. So one of the big complaints about bleach is that the fumes are noxious. They irritate our lungs, and so chances are they're irritating our, our patients' lungs too. Um, so we want to get this stuff out of the environment before we put the animals back in their cages. So the second category of disinfectants that we'll talk about are the quaternary ammonium. So examples are Rocal, Kenosol, A33, D256, Parvisol, et cetera. So if we take a look at what they kill, are they effective against parvovirus? No, not really. Panleukopenia? Oh, not really again. Khaleesi virus? Oh, no. <laughs> Are they inactivated by organic material mildly? OK, so there's something that they're better at than bleach. Stability when prepared, same as bleach, 24 hours. Minimum contact time, same as bleach, 10 minutes. Rinse required, yes, same as bleach. 
Our third category, potassium peroxymonosulfate, so that's going to be our trifectant and our vircon. Effective against parvovirus, yes. Panluc, yes. Ringworm, no. Khaleesi, yes. And activated by organic material, less inactivated than either our quats or our bleach. Stability when prepared, seven days, awesome. Minimum contact time, same across the board, 10 minutes. Is a rinse required? No. So therefore, we just get to cut out one, one step in our disinfection protocol if we're using the potassium peroxymonosulfates. So a newer shelter disinfectant that didn't make it onto the ASPCA's chart is Wissy Wash. So Wissy Wash is also known as calcium hypochlorite. It's related to bleach and has the same spectrum of activity as our bleach products, um, so which makes it effective against unenveloped viruses such as parvo, Khaleesi, panluc, etc. cetera. Uh, it's applied with a hose nozzle fixture which auto dilutes it on the way out, which means that it's particularly effective for your dog kennels and dog runs, um, but it's not so useful for cleaning your cat condos and kitten cages because chances are you're gonna end up with more of it on you than on the cage. So what I know some shelters do is they'll just take their wissy wash, spray it into a bucket, and then clean, um, clean the cages with a rag, which is a valid option, but you need to keep in mind that like bleach, wissy wash is also going to be inactivated by our organic material. So if you're going to be applying it with a rag, you need to use a different rag between each cage, and the rags need to be laundered every day. Um, and more recent yet, accelerated hydrogen peroxide, specifically a product called Excel, is uh, the new hot topic in medical disinfectants. It possesses more cleaning activity than the other disinfectants that we've talked about. It's more effective in the face of organic material. It works rapidly, it's relatively non-toxic, and it's stable in solution for up to 90 days. Sounds pretty good, right? Um, according to tests that were conducted by the manufacturer, so it can kill bacteria and viruses in as little as one minute and fungi in as little as five minutes. But again, that's coming from the manufacturer. But unfortunately, in spite of its impressive qualities, accelerated hydrogen peroxide is cost prohibitive for most shelters. So here's a cost comparison chart. Um, and so you can see that accelerated hydrogen peroxide is significantly more expensive than our bleaches, wissy washes, and quats, and then potassium peroxymonosulfates, which are still, even then, relatively much more expensive than our bleaches. So the bottom line is that no single disinfectant will be sufficient or economical for all situations. So it's useful for a shelter to have several disinfectants to choose from, depending on what they're trying to clean, um, as far as sub substrate goes, and what they're trying to kill, as far as microorganism goes. So the nice thing is that you don't have to sell your soul to just one devil. You can store all these products if you want to. Um, so a quaternary ammonia may be an adequate choice for daily disinfection of dog runs where parvo isn't a concern, but in light of certain outbreaks such as parvo, panluc, or Khaleesi, your quaternary ammonium is just isn't gonna be good enough. And in light of ringworm, you're gonna be best off with your bleach at a one to 10 dilution. So before we talk about disinfectant applications, I'd like to say a quick word about OSHA. So OSHA stands for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They're a federal agent that is charged with making sure that employers provide safe working conditions for all of their employees, and they have the ability to shut you down and fine you. They have countless rules about anything and everything regarding employee health, especially as far as hazardous chemicals and disinfectants are concerned. So it's really important to properly store and label hazardous chemicals. Drawing a skull and crossbones on an old bottle of Windex is not going to cut it. <laughs> so at the bare minimum, your bottle needs to include the name of the chemical, the dilution of the chemical, when it was mixed up, and the initials of who mixed it. And depending on which disinfectant you're going to be using, um, the four quadrant safety diamond might be required too. So for more information about what is required for your disinfectant, you can go to www.osha.gov. Um, improper chemical labeling is a really silly reason to be fined, and God forbid shut down. It's completely avoidable. Um, that said, I would never invite an OSHA representative to audit <laughs> your organization. If you have any questions, you could submit them anonymously online through their website. 
So applications. The first rule about disinfectant application um, is that it needs to be diluted properly. So one Luke Skywalker collectible Burger King mug of bleach to one Sherman Williams paint bucket of water just doesn't cut it, even if that's the way that things have run at your shelter for years. Uh, the second rule is that disinfectants have a minimum contact time, minimum 10 minutes across the board. And we also need to keep in mind that contact time means wet contact time. So if I apply my bleach solution to the floor and it dries in 10 minutes, I need to reapply it until I have 10 minutes of wet time. So now that we know how to apply disinfectants, what do we apply them with? Mops are bad. Mops are terrible tools for disinfection because they make such excellent fomites. Mops should be avoided if at all possible. That being said, I know that the majority of shelters still use mops to disinfect their floors. If you're going to use mops, um, there is a way that they should be used. So mops need to be used in conjunction with what's called a double bucket system. So we've got one bucket for our disinfectant and one bucket for water. So the mop gets rinsed of organic material between every disinfectant application. For cleaning smaller surfaces, so your squirt bottles are going to be better than your aerosol spray bottles, especially depending on the disinfectant that you're using, because what the spray bottle does is it aerosolizes it. We don't want that stuff in our lungs. We don't want that stuff in our animals' lungs. When you're cleaning small surfaces, what you want to do is spray it directly onto your paper towels slash rag, because what happens is when we spray it directly on the table is that all those viruses, bacteria, fungi that we're trying to kill have just been sprayed into the air. They've been sprayed onto the wall opposite. They've been sprayed onto the floor, which is really counterproductive. So once we spray our paper towel slash rag, what we want to do is clean and expanding circles, bring that contamination from the center of our surface out to the periphery. Cleaning organic surfaces is always a tricky issue because it's hard to disinfect what we can't clean. So as far as our organic substrates are concerned, a lot of shelters in their play yards, they'll have grass, some are dirt, some are gravel. Um, but it's hard to remove organic material from grass because it is organic material. So unless you want to pave over it, then we need to make some concessions. Uh, gravel is nice because it has better drainage than grass or dirt, which are pretty much impossible to clean. So if you have to choose a disinfectant for an organic substrate, what you need to ask yourself is what are you trying to kill? Did I have a parvo outbreak? Am I worried about some sort of bacterial URI? Am I worried about a different kind of virus? Did I have a ringworm outbreak? What you're trying to kill can help determine what sort of disinfectant you need to use. But because by nature these areas are hard to clean, therefore hard to disinfect, prevention is going to be key. And so that's going to come down to screening these animals for infectious diseases before they make it out onto our play yards, before they make it out into our community runs. Unless you're willing to resort to more incendiary measures. Okay, so what needs to be disinfected in our shelters? So usually when we think about shelter disinfection, we're focusing on our runs and our cages, but there are other sources of contamination throughout the shelter that are gonna be much more likely means of disease transmission. So for instance, um, so for instance, a dog run ideally is going to be uh, contaminated just by the germs of the dog that's in it, and our dog run stays in place. If we compare that to the scrub top of one of our employees that travels throughout the shelter multiple times a day, collecting germs from tens if not hundreds of animals, which is the more, you know, wh which one do we need to focus on, right? Which is the more likely source of contamination and disease transmission? Um, making a cleaning disinfection schedule is key. Whiteboards are nice, but I would argue that especially um, if you're moving to metrics and tracking your your disease um, rates throughout the shelter, then it's gonna be really nice to have a paper schedule, something that you can refer back to so I can know, okay, well, who cleaned, who cleaned the cat cages the second week of April? Because for some reason we had a spike of URIs. So it's entirely possible that the person responsible for cleaning, or especially if you're alternating disinfectants, what disinfectant you're using at that time could be tied to higher or lower instances of disease transmission.
We want to pay special attention to high risk areas. So those are going to be high contact areas, areas that come into contact with many animals throughout the day. So hallways, get acquainted rooms, etc. Areas associated with unvaccinated or juvenile animals, so such as our animal control vehicle, um, the hands and clothing of our intake staff, the intake counters. Areas associated with ill animals, so our clinics and our ISO wards, and areas for clean and sterile product storage. This one often gets overlooked. This stuff is piled in the hallway, sometimes it's piled on floors. We can't rely on its cleanliness or sterility if we're not storing it properly. The order of sanitation. So despite even the best of sanitation protocols, some germs are still being passed throughout the shelter because even with disinfection, we can't kill everything because we're not sterilizing. So with that said, um, to reduce the risk of disease transmission, what we want to do is clean. So our adoption area, so our healthy animals first, followed by our stray holding, and then last but not least, our sick animals. And within each of those categories, we want to clean our juveniles before we clean our adults because they're more likely to have um, that, well, they're less likely to have sufficient immunity to protect from certain diseases. Hands, so there are three methods of disinfecting and cleaning hands. So we've got gloves, hand washing, and hand sanitizers. Gloves are gonna be your most effective option provided that they're actually being changed before and after every animal they come into contact with. But unfortunately, especially as far as latex gloves are concerned, that can get really costly really fast. So one suitable alternative would be the lightweight food preparation gloves that the cafeteria ladies use. They can cost less than a penny a pair and they're really easy to take on and off very quickly. Hand washing is next. Um, so it's not, it's not gonna be as effective as wearing gloves, but um, the purpose of hand washing we need to remember is removal versus inactivation. So I'm trying to remove these stubborn bacteria, virus, and fungi that get on my hands. I'm not necessarily trying to inactivate them because it doesn't matter if they're alive if they're down the drain 50 miles away. Uh, the CDC says that we need to scrub our hands for 20 minutes and dry thoroughly, dry thoroughly. Oh, I'm sorry, 20 seconds. <laughs> Uh, and last but not least, hand sanitizers. So hand sanitizers have limited efficacy and it drives me crazy because when you populate your shelter with hand sanitizers, people start using hand sanitizers as a replacement for hand washing and that's not what they're meant to do. Hand sanitizers usually have an alcohol base. Alcohol is a pretty wussy disinfectant and so it's not gonna be sufficient, especially when you're handling um, your unvaccinated juvenile or sick animals. Hand sanitizers, are best placed in your adoption areas because those animals up there should already be healthy slash non-infectious anyway. Feet, so there are two methods for cleaning slash uh, preventing contamination via feet. So foot baths, number one. So we've got um, proper traditional foot bath versus foaming mat. Um, foot baths are not ideal because first and foremost, they're just not that effective. So like we already discussed, we need a minimum contact time in order for our disinfectants to be effective. And that's just not gonna happen with a quick dip in the foot bath. Um, they're also labor intensive, so I can't just put this down and leave it for a week. It's gotta be somebody's job to change this and changing it is usually pretty darn messy. And it can also cause damage to your shoes. What do you think those leather loafers look like at the end of the day? They're not pretty. So dedicated shoe covers are gonna be a better option for preventing contamination uh, via footwear. And so your two options are going to be either the reusable rubber over boots or the disposable plastic over shoes. Laundry, do it. Um, typically one cup of bleach to one load is sufficient, but again, we have to remove our organic material first Get rid of the poop, get rid of the vomit, get rid of the urine, et cetera, et cetera. Don't overload. An overloaded washer isn't an effective washer. Dry on high heat. If you don't have a dryer, sunlight's gonna be better than hanging it in the basement where it stays wet longer. And you wanna transport it with clean hands and clothes. So it's gonna be really counterproductive if I spend two hours doing a load of laundry just to take it out and fold it wearing my dirty scrub top that I've had on for eight hours. 
And so last but not least, common errors that we see in shelters. So improper dilution, failure to reliably measure out the dilution of the products you're using. So this cat on the right, um, his cage was cleaned with a quaternary ammonium that was too strong. It wasn't rinsed properly, it got on his fur, he groomed his fur, and now he has an ulcerated tongue. Improper contact time. So what's the minimum contact time we need across the board? 10 minutes. Ten minutes. Excellent. Insufficient drying. So once our 10 minutes has elapsed, we need to do whatever we can to dry our floors, whether that be a squeegee, whether it means turning on mechanical fans, if it means altering the ratio um, of your air circulation unit, we need to dry as soon as possible because wet environments breed bacteria, breed fungi, breed the stuff that we're trying to kill. Sanitizer replacing hand washing, we already covered that. Cluttered surfaces is one of my personal pet peeves, especially in areas that house sick animals. So even though this might seem relatively innocuous, this is an exam table. Nothing should live on an exam table. Not clippers, not a sharps container, nothing. Because this is where our sick animals go. This is where they're shedding their bacteria, they're shedding their virus, they're shedding their fungal spores. If you have stuff that lives on your exam table, I guarantee you're not cleaning it properly, you're not disinfecting it properly, that's where that stuff is gonna collect. And last but not least, lack of enforcement. So it doesn't matter if you design the perfect protocol for your shelter, pin it up where anybody can see it, if nobody's actually in charge of enforcing it. Despite our best efforts, despite our best intentions, if it's nobody's job to keep track of this stuff, corners are gonna start being cut. So you need a flow bee, you also need a, dis a disinfection bee. Maybe it's the same person, maybe it's not. And so that's the conclusion of my presentation. I would like to thank Maddie's Fund and the ASPCA for sponsoring not only my position, but this conference. And these are my sources and resources. This is where you can get uh, the disinfection comparison chart from ASPCA Pro. Here's OSHA's website again, and then sheltermedicine.com also has some great resources as far as shelter disinfection is concerned. Yeah.